Okay, then a very warm welcome to today's um, eighth trace, trace lecture um, in our lecture series uh, of the Network Transformations of Political Violence. Um, and we're very happy to have um, Dr. Judith Vorrat here today um, for this uh, last lecture of this year. She came from Berlin and made it on time. And so this is already a big win. The live stream is working, the microphone is working. So um, great. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your, um, uh, to your presentation today. Um, she will talk to us about illicit networks and violence. Um, and she works as a senior associate um, at the SWP, at Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, which is the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. She's there th since uh, 2012. Um, she works in the research division, international security, um, on non-state violence, security and defense policy, UN global governance and international law, civil wars, fragile, organized crime, um, and then also um, specifically again at the um, on the UN and the Security Council. Um, and her focus, as well as her presentation today or her talk today, is on illicit economies um, and organized crime and violent conflicts and in fragile um, states and UN sanctions. Um, and we will hear something about this. Um, she has widely uh, published in German and English about this. Uh, there's some really interesting publications on uh, crises related to um, the corona um, pandemic um, and um, African contexts. Um, um, yeah, as a sort of regional focus. Um, and with that, I think uh, I will just hand over to you. Um, and we're looking forward to hear from you. And then we have time for the discussion later on. Thanks. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, that sounded like I'm working on a lot of things, <laughs> diverse topics, set of topics. Um, that's probably due to the fact that we have some kind of fixed categories on the SWP website um, that we are kind of, you know, um, bound to use. And the reference, of course, is correct, but really illicit economies and organized crime in the context of violent conflict is one of the key areas I really work on. And that's the one I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and hopefully also then in an interactive way later on to discuss with you and hear you comments, ideas, and questions. Um, basically, I have four sections in my presentation and I didn't prepare PowerPoint actually because I was thinking illicit economies and violence or violent conflict, um, which is my focus today is actually a very um, broad topic and has many different entry points. Uh, sometimes I find it quite nice to have some maps or illustration by PowerPoint slides, but uh, it's also distractive sometimes. And I don't wanna um, lose you in a lot of details and, 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 um, and uh, visualization uh, and rather you know, try to bring across some key points that I think have been important in the academic debate. That's my first section um, on illicit economies and violent conflict. And that's already a very diverse debate. There are many different strands of literature and research, of course. I can't cover all of them, but I will try to give you an idea of how, what have been kind of some main arguments and points of research um, with regard to the link of illicit economies and violent conflict. And the second section will then be more about the political debate, uh, the point of view of, from different policy fields, um, policy interventions um, on this issue that have also developed kind of in parallel and sometimes in connection to the academic debate. And then the third one will be on what kind of more concrete approaches and instruments have developed or have adapted to um, this challenge of illicit economies in violent conflict. And then finally give you some insights from a paper I published together um, with my um, research um, assistant or intern at the time um, this year on three concrete contexts, the Central African Republic, Mali, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, looking at different reporting lines on UN sanctions, um, UN sanctions monitoring reporting lines with regard to illicit economies and give you some insights on some of the key points we came across um, from more recent cases. Um, so to start with, um, I don't know, Meta, I ask you first, um, do all of you have an idea or 
something in mind that you think is uh, what illicit economies really means. Uh, don't worry if you raise your hand, I'm not going to ask you about your definition, but uh, maybe you can raise your hands if you think you actually know what it is or could be. Um, that's quite, yeah, okay, that might be even the majority of people. Uh, and maybe you can then see in the end whether it is what you expected or uh, or it, it is maybe something else. Um, I'm, I'm keen to know about that when we discuss later on. Um, for me, illicit economies um, basically is about transactions and commodities um, that are legally prohibited or officially banned. Um, doesn't, ha doesn't necessarily mean that these are uh, illegal products like drugs, but it can also be um, uh, legally banned um, production um, or trade. So maybe um, some things are not according to regulation in the context, and then this would account for being part of the illicit economy. Um, there are two caveats before I really start with the first section, and one is really about the terms. So when I talk about uh, what links are there between illicit economies and violent conflict later on, not all of the contributions I refer to and the discussions are using the same terms. Some are referring to organized crime, some are referring to illegal markets, or have other concepts on this side. And then on violent conflict, you know better than me that there are many different ways to approach um, context either you know the you know you have civil war literature uh, you have armed conflict um, organized violence different concepts and then there's also rebellion insurgencies um, you know as a reference point for the debate I'm talking about so uh, we have to keep that in mind because not everybody talks about exactly the same thing <laughs> all the time so um, even though I'm you know discussing some general points um, they are seen from slightly different angles um, and the second maybe more even more important thing to keep in mind is all numbers uh, regarding illicit economies and that's also true of course for organized crime have to be taken with a grain of salt or even more than that um, so we don't really and illicit economies by nature are you know kind of hidden um, or at least um, have an element of uh, being clandestine or trying to avoid certain formal structures and so I mean usually we don't have a full picture or we can by definition not have a full picture uh, and we have to keep that in mind because there are different ways of approaching this problem one way that is sometimes used but it, it's sometimes also a miss you know um, um, short-sighted that is you know to really rely just on crime statistics for example and that's an aspect to look at for some patterns maybe but that is not the picture of crime that's the picture of law enforcement basically but um, these are things to keep in mind when we're talking about um, these kind of contexts, especially when it is in a context of violent conflict, because obviously their access is even more difficult, information can be much more difficult to have, and also, you know, labels and concepts are much less clear, as most of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Um, but just to say that in the beginning before I'm moving on. So um, when I talk about illicit economies, the term of organized crime will come up as well quite frequently. Um, and just to say, illicit economies do not contain organized crime per se, but they do have sometimes or even more frequent um, organized crime as a component. So it, it is, you know, they are linked, of course. Some people say illicit economies are basically transactional crime, while other crime is predatory, like armed robbery uh, or kidnapping for ransom, for example. I would rather, you know, because also transactional crime like you find in illicit economies can actually also be predatory uh, and include coercion, uh, for example, human trafficking. So I would rather say, you know, it's it's important to maybe distinguish illicit economies that have often a equivalent in the legal economy, um, something that can also be legally done um, to basically um, differentiate it from violent crime, that by committing the crime, actually um, the use of concrete physical violence is already part of that or the threat of violence. Um, that having said that, also this, these kind of threats can commonly occur in illicit economies, of course. Uh, maybe a word on how I approached the topic myself when I started to look into this around 2013, when I arrived at SWP basically, um, shortly after that. Um, I, I, I um, took up a project there that had already been um, 
uh, started, and that was on transnational organized crime in fragile states in West Africa. Um, that was an established title, and uh, I soon into the research discovered that maybe instead of starting with organized crime in contexts like Sierra Leone and Liberia, where I did my field research, it's much better to approach these contexts from this illicit economy um, conceptual point of view. Uh, and then maybe later on ask what could maybe be grasped as organized crime or how is it organized in what way instead of starting off by by assuming this. And I also relied heavily with, you know, Sierra Leone and Liberia have been studied quite intensely from a conflict research, especially um, a conflict economy point of view. So I have taken advantage of that and also built on this. And this is um, in the first section on the academic debate, really the kind of first broad type of literature. Um, that's basically the economic theory of your rebellion, if you want. Uh, maybe some of you heard about, it was about 2000, it really um, uh, maybe started uh, the greed versus grievance and civil war debate, uh, you know, are um, armed groups primarily um, interested uh, in economic gains, are they motivated by greed or rather by grievance? Uh, that means like having a kind of political agenda, you know, that is built on grievances. Uh, and this, you know, a very prominent um, contribution to that debate on the greed side was um, the Collier and Hoefler article in 2004. And they basically said, um, you know, there are three ways of financing a rebellion. Um, and besides, um, diasporas and hostile governments being a source of financing. Uh, a third very important one they looked into was natural resource extortion. Uh, and their finding at the time was that primary commodity experts actually significantly incre increase conflict risk. And this, is a, this has been a quantitative approach. So um, that this very general finding came out of this. Um, obviously this has been uh, criticized on many grounds by people who are more on the grievance side of things, but also by people who say we can't really uh, separate those two and there's too many um, interaction effects and this is really too simplifying. Um, I don't want to discuss that here because it's for the illicit economy aspect, it's not so important, I would say. Um, it is important, but it's not the key point we can take from this literature, I think. It rather is that even those who oppose this greed idea or this greed argument um, they at least also referred um, to um, resource generation by, and that wasn't not only a natural resource extortion, but it was also looting, um, control of trade that had previously been prohibited, like drug trade or weapons trade um, or labor exploitation. And so this debate um, generally started to have a stronger focus on, you know, what types of illicit economies are relevant and in what way. So that was a contribution, whether you like the greed versus grievance idea or discussion, but um, that was important. And a second around the same time debate, and many of you probably came across it, is the one on new wars. Um, and basically, again, this was like a two-side debate, at least in the beginning on um, do we see a new kind of type of war or warfare, or uh, is this just something that has been a gradual um, evolution of war and conflict and nothing really new actually um, has been happening? As a proponent of the new war um, concept, Mary Calder, who was a very prominent proponent of it, uh, she even said in 2013, she defended that concept again against many of the um, of the critics, and I just want to read it out because I think it kind of depicts the main idea on illicit economies quite well. Uh, and she said that old wars were largely financed by states, taxation, or by outside patrons. In weak states, tax revenue is falling, and new forms of predatory private finance include loot and pillage, taxation of humanitarian aid, um, pri pri diaspora support, kidnapping or smuggling in oil, diamonds, drugs, and people, etc. So this was even though this strand of literature was rather looking into the changing character of organized violence and not so much why they start, what the motivation of groups or the opportunities are, they were actually uh, looking at similar illicit economies that are relevant uh, in, the, in the context of political violence. Um, what they also did was um, that they stressed instead of the greed versus grievance idea that the two kind of go together and interact. So this was 
a strong uh, differentiation from the earlier one or from the from the parallel debate. Uh, um, but there also was this strong assumption that there are weak states that have a hard time controlling their resources, and thus this be really becomes um, so, uh, a source of financing for armed groups. This was kind of a, a very similar core, core uh, assumption of them. Now, some of the critics of the new war's idea saying this is not really new or saying this is not really war, it is rather crime or having other um, opposing views uh, and opposing readings of the, the development of war and conflict. Um, they, however, took up the idea um, of looking uh, more deeply into the political economy of civil wars and into the dynamics. And they were approaching uh, also the, the issue of um, how can war economies be transformed or how do they transform um, over time. Um, there were some more like practical research projects there, for example, the Economic Agendas and Civil Wars project by the International Peace Institute. So this, you know, this general idea that illicit economies matter uh, in, in um, violent conflicts uh, was taken up by those projects, even though they may have opposed uh, some of the other assumptions of those, um, of those um, research uh, contributions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and they kind of moved on with the debate, more looking into policy interventions and more concrete questions, actually, mostly on looking into, by more looking into case studies um, more deeply. And basically they, you know, the, the project I just mentioned kind of concluded economic agendas are consequential um, to the character and duration of civil war. And they also complicate efforts of conflict resolution. Uh, and this was then a main reasoning behind actually looking uh, better understanding the political economy of, the, of those conflicts. And there's one thing that I think is quite important in, in one of the reports out of those projects. Um, the researcher Karen Ballantyne says that we really have to uh, differentiate between different actors, one being those who exploit resources for war, and those are conflict entrepreneurs, basically. And those who exploit war for access to resources, the people kind of taking advantage of the opportunities uh, and those are conflict exploiters. And one of those has been released from US prison, I think last week, Victor Gott. I mean, many have probably heard about that case. Uh, he was, his interest really was basically to sell weapons to conflict zones and to other areas in the world, to other world regions, um, partly in exchange for natural resources, as in the case of Liberia or Sierra Leone there. There was this, uh, the, the, con the connection to Liberia um, was quite strong and also in the media, but there have been many other connections to other conflict areas in his case. And kind of his business interests were uh, strongly, uh, you know, were, were driving uh, his action. But of course, on the ground, there were other actors involved in the conflict. And those were, according to this definition, the conflict entrepreneurs. And Another group that we have to talk about are the conflict dependents, and these are usually civilian parts of the civilian population, at least who actually depend on illicit economies for, if only survival, or at least for having, uh, you know, um, a way to, to get by and in this context. So they often may not even have a real choice. Um, they're really depending on, on this kind of income and um, sometimes may, of course, also be forced to participate in certain uh, activities. And those three groups um, is still, those are like, it's, it's still a very strong argument in the current debate, I would say, that we have to really look at what does it do for people's livelihood uh, on the ground. Um, you know, when there is policy interventions, this is a very, very strong point. And that, I think, came also a lot of, out of this um, part of the literature. And finally, there's a, a much more critical um, um, literature, and that's there are many different contributions to that. They are not really part of the same discipline or the same strand of literature, but different aspects I just want to touch upon because I think they're interesting for you um, to think about as well. Um, and one of them is, of course, that much of what I have been saying came out of studies on with a country focus. Uh, but what is actually happening at a subnational level on the local level? Um, there has been some ethnographic research, for example, looking into what illicit economies not only look like at that level, but they also concluded they're actually not always, um, you know, a source of disorder. There's also order in this and there's, uh, you know, it, they can create, if only a kind of fragile, but at least some kind of stability. 
Uh, and this might actually be um, even more common. We don't really know. It's not a quantitative approach, but uh, this might actually be more frequent than, uh, you know, having actual um, violence and an opposition towards the state. That was another point. That's not necessarily the case according to this part of the literature. And it was also opposing, of course, kind of the Western notion of um, uh, of statehood and generally Western concept like the organized crime and others saying, you know, they're really so difficult to apply in these contexts and they're not really grasping what is happening. It's basically throwing labels at things we don't really understand. So that was um, their kind of criticism. Um, I think they have, this is a very valuable part of the literature in terms of understanding the governance, also criminal governance. If criminal is a label that you can actually uh, identify or use in those contexts. Um, uh, especially, uh, you can also simply look at illicit economies in general, and then you know um, the the question really is what what is the governance and what is what is driving them and wh who are really the actors, how are they linked, etc. Um, and the second, I think, very useful and 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 important uh, part of the literature is. Um, uh, the one that is looking into illegal markets, because this is really the other side. It's not the subnational level, it's what is happen happening transnational or globally even, because these are like uh, links that go sometimes very far from the areas we're talking about, uh, and they are interest of different market actors in this. So this, this part of the literature is really um, about social organization of illegal markets. And in that, there are a couple of points that are really important, I think. One is that um, the relationship between legality and legitimacy. So this is not the same thing. Uh, and this is also about social norms. So this is something you know, we should be looking at when we talk about illicit economies. Um, the other is interfaces between legal and illegal. Um, and sometimes there is this implicit or explicit assumption um, the two are kind of like the underworld and the upper world in crime, you know, um, they can be distinguished. And yes, formally, they may probably be distinguishable, but uh, in reality, it's of, often a very blurred line. And especially when you look at markets and illicit flows, uh, there are legal and illegal aspects um, and transactions in these. Uh, and this is something that this literature really points out. Another one is that the state is actually quite often, at least in some areas, an actor in these illegal markets. This does not only mean states turning a blind eye to some activities or looking more or less <laughs> to enforce the law, but really sometimes it's about protecting certain uh, illegal markets of transactions and even engaging in, for example, illicit trade themselves, being actors in this. And this is something that has been pointed out today in also the more practical um, debates, but uh, it's still something that's sometimes uh, forgotten when we discuss about this link. Uh, and then finally, Another part is about what actually do the international actors that are present in those contexts quite often. And one important focus point were UN peacekeeping missions or peacekeeping peace operations more generally. Um, for example, Peter Andreas is quite well known to have been looking into this in Bosnia, for example, um, looking into kind of the symbiosis between peace operations and illicit business, saying on the one hand, uh, the international presence, in this case a peacekeeping mission, can fuel black markets illicit activities. Um, and on the other hand, also illicit economies and the actors involved can contribute to creating or to supporting the goals that the mission actually has. Uh, you know, if it is only, um, you know, providing for the civilian population or stabilizing the overall context, but they may not always be spoilers, they could also be contributing. Um, from the point of view of uh, mandates of peace operations. Um, and this was important, of course, to understand that international actors are not just bystanders and separated entities in those contexts, but they do not, and they also do not just relate to these illicit economic uh, activities, but they become somehow part of it. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on, um, you know, sexual exploitation that has been fueled by, um, uh, by demand by peacekeeping forces. That is, and that has happened, but it's not by far not the only aspect, and it's maybe also not um, the the one that, in terms of illicit economies, is always relevant. Um, but it was important, of course, also to to um, uh, improving the conduct of peacekeeping missions uh, 
um, the the different the blue helmets. Um, but you know there are other aspects as well. You're fueling a black market if you by procurement, uh, by the money that you're actually spending in in these areas and countries. Um, you provide transport. Uh, usually, you and planes are uh, you know really relevant means of transport transport in those areas, and that can also be used by smugglers, etc. So there's many links of that type that this you know these kind of um, contributions have been pointing towards. So. All of these that have been fundamentally critical or kind of constructively critical and complementary to the previous works mentioned, um, I think have all added something to the debate that was not really so prominent before that people were not that aware of. Um, I would say in the second part I'm, I want to talk about that um, that is the more practical policy um, uh, relevant if you want debates or simply those tied to specific policy fields. Obviously, it really depends where in the world you are, how, you know, the way the debates go depend in what country you are, um, what system is in that country, the foreign policy of it and so on. But still internationally, at the international level, um, there have been some general debates uh, at various levels. Um, and those have been informed sometimes by the academic uh, literature, but also, of course, um, being rather separated. Um, the one that I mentioned, kind of touched upon before, um, the, quite, the very um, kind of uh, the, the literature on peace and uh, conflict that has been quite close um, to, to policy circles already, the International Peace Institute's program, for example, um, that has actually started or pushed a debate forward um, that was already ongoing since the beginning of the 2000s on what do actors like UN missions do? Because not it was not only after those um, after the criticism, but even before they, a lot of um, heads of mission and others in missions got aware that uh, this is something to look at, uh, and uh, you know from different points of views in order to um, be able to support peace processes or simply fulfill their mandate on the ground. Uh, and this debate has is still ongoing. Uh, there's obviously no final, final conclusion to it, also because, of course, missions and their environments have been changing as well. Um, but you can really see that that's also mirrored in more resolutions by the UN Security Council referring to either organized crime generally mostly in relation to terrorism, but also like concrete illicit economies in the countries or regions they are discussing and the resolutions deal with. And that has actually been rising significantly in the last 10, 15 years. That's just an expression of that this has become more important in debates. Um, but when you look at the UN missions, their mandates usually have not significantly changed. Uh, and there's often mentioning of illicit economies and organized crime, but very few mandated tasks in single cases, um, yet there is more awareness, better information on average, uh, even intelligence uh, and training. And some missions take a kind of indirect approach, um, you know, in supporting, for example, national authorities in tackling illicit economies and or organized crime at various points. And I will say something more concrete about that later. But that has been um, one prominent debate. And it's not just on peacekeeping, it's on peacemaking building more generally. Uh, more and more actors, I would say, wonder in general first what to do with illicit economies and their operating environments, but um, then also if they have means to address um, the issues it has for violent conflict, uh, because they all don't have uh, a mandate to combat organized crime, obviously. Uh, that's that's not their, usually not their task, but they have to somehow adapt. Uh, um, and that's, at least that's the debate and it's still ongoing. But a second one has also been more from a security focus and that's internal security here. But this is the kind of the classic uh, starting point for looking into organized crime in a way. Um, and then the question really is what, what do you look at? What is, you know, what illicit economies matter? Mm -hmm. And when it is about conflict environments in a, in a wider sense, um, then the question really is, um, why is it relevant from an internal security point of view, for example? And usually it is because there are certain 
you know, interests um, linked to specific types of illicit economy and organized crime. And one very prominent focus has been the crime terror nexus that some of you may have come across that term. So either, um, you know, crime financing terrorism uh, or even going up all the way to alliances or at least cooperation between terrorist groups and criminal groups. Um, this is kind of the assumption that that is a key po a key uh, worry and a key point to look at. Um, now, the issue with that is um, that it is basically, or it has been criticized for, uh, you know, um, approaching illicit economies um, in other world regions from the security interest point of view of Western countries, European countries, for example, in, in the Sahel, um, kind of outsourcing a certain uh, task to tackle um, uh, and to counter terrorism uh, to those areas um, and, you know, kind of taking uh, the, the, as a starting point the interest. We are looking at, at those illicit economies that matter uh, for European countries most. And this is what, what we focus on, in a sense, in our cooperation. Um, and from an internal security point of view, might be... Um, um, very um, logic and, and the way to go, but the, the criticism really is that this has also trickled into the foreign policy debate and also um, the actual policy towards specific states and regions, and that this is very much driving what, for example, European countries bilaterally support in other countries. Um, when you look at, at the facts, and I mean, I haven't looked at all of them uh, for even one single country, there's a lot happening. It might actually not always be that clear cut, um, but you can really see how the way organized crime, for example, has been approached in some countries in the Sahel, it has been quite strongly different, but driven by this debate on uh, the crime terror nexus or um, uh, tackling irregular migration, for example, and then looking at migrant smuggling and human trafficking, for example. So this, uh, at least in rhetoric and in some programming, uh, that has been identified as a pattern. Uh, so that is kind of the internal security uh, point of view. But I would say what it has added when it comes to organized crime is the kind of criminal justice point of view, uh, reminding us that law, this is really an issue for law enforcement, not the military usually. Um, there are military actors in law enforcement in some countries, but most of the time it is about law enforcement and the judiciary. And this is uh, something that has to be strengthened. And uh, it's also about ending impunity in 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 some uh, countries or areas. Um, and this is also an important relevant um, factor actually to keep in mind, of course. Um, and then third, there's actually also the, the development policy or development cooperation um, related debate. Um, and that is mostly looking into organized crime and fragility, um, assuming that illicit economies inhibit development and undermine statehood. That's at least not everybody's assuming that to the same degree as in all the other categories, but it's a very prominent argument. Um, and what this has, you know, brought to the table, I think, is that we should be looking at illicit economies in these environments um, more widely and not only look at the security, the hard, hard security uh, issues, but also look at other harm uh, that is done um, at other levels, um, whether that's economic losses or, uh, you know, uh, whether it's um, endangering the environment uh, or help people's health, uh, look at it more broadly. And um, maybe for some surprisingly, but logically from that point of view, the topic of organized crime also made it uh, into the sustainable development goals. Um, it's uh, under 16.4, tackling all forms of organized crime and uh, some other specific references to illicit financial and arms flows are in there and asset recovery. But there's actually, when you look across the sustainable development goals, there's reference to all types of trafficking and illicit economies actually in various, um, under various goals. Um, so this is also partly due to that debate um, I was referring to. Um, the downside maybe is one, is that obviously the concept of fragility or fragile state who has also been challenged and the question um, of you know um, having that as a main entry point also in uh, addressing the problem because then obviously good governance is 
for example, a main entry point. And that has, of course, also been challenged uh, um, in by some of the critics, saying, for example, that, you know, if you strengthen institutions in specific countries, it's also a matter how legitimate are they and, uh, uh, and what do they actually do then when they address organized crime. Uh, and there, a lot of warnings have been sent out saying you have to look at the political economy, of course, of the conflict and uh, in that area um, to better understand, you know, to what those interventions may actually lead. So those are, you know, is a very, very rough, broad overview, and it doesn't do justice to all the the, the really li all lines of arguments in all those debates. But uh, a rough overview for you, um, what where this comes from, and what a different pros and cons have been in those debates. Um, I want to maybe at this point, before I move on, uh, give you the opportunity to, if you want to ask a question or comment on something or there's a matter that you need some clarification or inform more information, then feel free. <laughs> if not now, then we can, we can uh, pick up all the points later. We can take it up later. Um, then I would um, actually say a bit more about the approaches, the concrete approaches that some of the actors I already mentioned have been have taken, um, and uh, others that we haven't been talking about. Um, UN sanctions is something that has been mentioned in the beginning, and I will say a little bit about it later. Um, you may wonder about, you know, the relation uh, of that to illicit economies, but there are various links as well. Um, now, the first thing to say maybe is what what do we talk about uh, really, and. Um, uh, and often, uh, you know, cases like uh, Afghanistan, Colombia, uh, I mentioned Sierra Leone and Liberia, uh, or Angola, um, and the Western Balkans come to mind, for example, if, if I'm talking now about, again, the country level uh, or the regional level, um, and different illicit economies that have been very prominent uh, in those cases in the debate, uh, whether it was drug cultivation of different kinds and trafficking um, or uh, natural resource related illicit economies. Um, those are the ones that always come to mind, but obviously there are many more contexts where um, political violence or violent conflict are linked to illicit economies um, and, and both are there at the same time. Um, so for the actors that, that are on the ground in those, uh, in those contexts, um, the main first main question is, and that has been a strong part also in the conflict, related debate on the so-called crime conflict nexus in this case is do no harm, which has been an older concept that has been transformed into do no crime, meaning we shouldn't make it worse than it actually, uh, that it already is in a sense. Um, so that is what I mentioned in the beginning uh, on the case of Bosnia, this finding that there has been this symbiosis basically of peace operations uh, and illicit uh, economies and um, this is something that this approach wants to at minimize or avoid. Um, and that can mean different things. It means better analysis and information sharing, of course. It means uh, that you look into your procurement systems. Uh, you have certain safeguards and checks and balances within, for example, peacekeeping missions, if we talk about missions here. Um, but it has turned out, obviously, that this is a very difficult thing to do for not just peacekeeping missions in in those contexts. Um, it is still a problem of um, sometimes awareness and really actually um, the knowledge of people on the ground, but it also is a practical problem. Um, if, for example, you say we really want to procure goods and commodities, etc., from the local market, to also give, you know, contribute to income, then you very quickly may run into a situation where you're working um, with actors that are involved in illicit economies, of course. So if you really have a strict do no crime approach in that sense, that will be very difficult. Um, uh, another point, of course, is um, that um, when you deal with illicit economies in a wider sense, and I've mentioned that before, state actors may be involved as well, or political actors may be involved, and that's a very sensitive issue uh, in the sense that as a peacekeeping mission, for example, you need the consent of the host government, you need to interact with them, 
um, and also rely on certain uh, channels of communication, of course, etc. So uh, then when you look into this issue and you come across this involvement, then that might be, uh, it might be very difficult to avoid interaction, obviously. Um, it becomes sometimes even more difficult when, when you look at the second approach and that is secure your own programs. And if it's very simply just the security of your personnel, but it's not just, it's sometimes very difficult. Um, this is more like dealing with the consequences of some illicit economies that might be a source of, of violence um, quite, quite visibly, um, or that simply might not actually be so violent, but threaten the success of some of your projects uh, or, you know, your access to some areas. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is like how we set up a program, a project in the context. And um, the question then is how can we actually implement it in with you know vis-a-vis -vis those actors that might have an influence in the same area and the third and that's the most difficult approach is um, you actually work on addressing illicit economies or even organized crime uh, not combating as i said before normally but you want to try find ways to uh you know contribute at least to to tackling these illicit economies and their negative impact on uh, on peace for example um and there have been various ways of that have been proposed and even tried. Uh, to give you examples, uh, as usually the way um, the law enforcement, the criminal justice way I mentioned before is very difficult in those environments or actually even may also be a harmful um, approach. Um, then there is at least something that international actors have been doing and are still doing that's deterrence. So you work with the local authorities, security sector, and um, you know, you you have provide technical assistance, for example, or even operational one, and try to make sure there are, for example, seizures of drugs from time to time, and that's sending a message to some actors, and and they may use other routes. It, you may not actually um, uh, eradicate really that trade, of course, but at least maybe you make it more costly or more difficult for these actors, and especially in transit zones. This has been used, you know, um, it has also been used uh, for piracy um, off the coast of Somalia, for example, to kind of deter certain activities, make them more difficult, more costly, etc. And um, this has been a way of doing it. However, what this, of course, means it doesn't end impunity. Usually um, it means, you know, there may be people arrested, uh, there may be drugs seized, but you may not actually um, really change the culture of impunity, as it's often called. Um, because people walk free later on, uh, maybe, you know, buying buying uh, their way out, uh, for example, as a common, common scheme. Um, another one has been trying to de-link um, politics and illicit economies or organized crime. Uh, so the influence that the money from those economies can buy is, you know, uh, significant in some cases. Uh, but if you have more transparent, if you create more transparency by anti-corruption efforts, et cetera, um, or uh, if you uh, have better regulation, that's actually also meaningful <laughs> and implemented on political party financing or campaign financing, that's another entry point. Um, but as you may notice, these are all like well, there's a certain focus on in rules and institutions as well there. So um, there might be also difficulty in that, of course. Another one is um, trying to de-link violence uh, and, and, well, crime or illicit economies. And that's a very common thing that sanctions try to do. This is what sanctions on, for example, commodity bans try to do. Um, that, you know, you uh, try to take income away from violent actors um, by inhibiting that specific type of trade. Trade, for example, charcoal um, from Somalia uh, is a current commodity ban that's still in place, um, and this is another approach. But as has been shown, the problem there is it can really fuel the black market. It, it can shift to other actors. Um, the other thing is, and that's on UN sanctions, maybe um, also interesting that some or actually most of the conflict-related sanctions regimes at the UN have introduced listing criteria, so you can list persons or entities for being involved in illicit economies if they are supporting spoilers of peace processes or armed groups or criminal networks. So this is possible. And the monitoring groups that look at the implementation of those sanctions report 
on this kind of involvement. So they also report quite a bit on illicit markets or economies in those um, cases. But actually, um, uh, there's very little listings that are based on this criteria, these criteria in those sanctioned regimes. Uh, very few. I mean, there are often relatively little listings in those regimes in general, but those listings relating to illicit economies that are explicitly possible are absolutely rare. So um, you can see that, yes, it might be an entry point, but it hasn't really been used. And the other issue, and that's something that I bring up in my work that from this year that I'm just going to refer to briefly after, um, um, the other issue is that the question really is what does this do with the respective violence and conflict? Um, you may be able um, to list someone or a group for being involved in illicit economic activities, um, but what do you want to achieve with that when you look at, you know, um, uh, ending violence or, you know, building peace? And that's when you look at it when you look what the Security Council actually decides on or the committees under the Security Council on sanctions, um, that's normally not systematically done. Uh, having clear political objectives that has to do with the decision making, but also with you know, uh, capacities and, uh, and other uh, inhibiting factors. But you really have to be sure, ideally, um, if this or that um, sanction is imposed or person or entities listed, what should this be doing? And and what do we want to achieve? And if this is achieved, the person or the entity can be delisted again, something that rarely happens. Um, so this link to clear political objectives that relate to the violence or the violent conflict um, often is not really there. And uh, that is also another reason, I think, why this hasn't really been working, uh, not only because it has just not been used, but also because this kind of systematic thinking and decision-making is not there for whatever reasons, for different reasons. Um, there are actually a lot more <laughs> approaches I could talk about. Maybe one last one, because this is on the livelihood aspect of illicit economies again, that I mentioned earlier, um, that has already been up, brought up in the academic debate. Uh, that is um, economic transformation. This is something that alternative... Um, development programs have tried to do in drug cultivation areas, you know, finding other uh, means of survival for people uh, planting coca in Colombia or people uh, doing poppy cultivation in Afghanistan. And there has also been a very mixed record of that um, for various reasons as well. Um, even though those programs have certainly improved over time and have become more sophisticated, uh, obviously it's not always easy to sustain uh, these livelihoods and the conditions under which they can actually work. Um, the other aspect is that you usually need, um, is the legitimacy aspect that has been mentioned before. Uh, you know, there have been attempts to involve civil society and do more, you know, raise awareness also in communities about the harm that certain illicit activities can do or have been doing. Um, so that's part of a transformation approach as well. But obviously that is very difficult if it's about means of livelihood and also if it there are maybe um, also legitimate actors involved that are actually looked at from the point of view of communities in a rather positive way, for example. Um, but this is another approach that has been, has been used or is still used. To move on very briefly, because yes, you should also still have time to, to, and, uh, to discuss and, and have your comments uh, also um, raise your points. Um, just from my paper that I, I wrote this year, this has really been, it's really uh, with a focus that is more recent, the last five years more or less of the reports I just mentioned by UN expert groups that monitor sanctions. Uh, what is interesting about them is not that they are a clear depiction of reality because they have their guidelines, they have their mandates, they have their, the, there is an interest of um, the Security Council and states behind it, uh, uh, you know, so they are not um, just going out and looking at any type of illicit economy and links to conflict actors. What they do is, of course, uh, you know, uh, predefined in a mandate and, and by guidelines. And then there's also differences in the how the panels are set up. And obviously, therefore, this is not a completely objective source of information. But the interesting thing I thought is that 
Um, it's a source that's often uh, quoted in uh, works on illicit economies in the areas of violent conflict, but rarely systematically used, uh, even though they report once or twice a year, usually twice. Um, and at least <laughs> across the different sanctions regime, almost all of them have these expert groups now, and they are supposed to be independent, um, meaning those are experts of different backgrounds, looking into various aspects of the sanctions regimes and also looking at illicit economies um, for various reasons, because there's a commodity ban maybe, or because of the, the listing criteria that I mentioned, but also the, the general other general issues of financing of armed groups that are linked to this. Um, and they can make recommendations as well to the committee at, under the Security Council. Um, so it's not irrelevant, and it's a source that is often quoted, but rarely systematically looked at. And what I thought was interesting maybe is to look at the more recent reports on the three countries I mentioned, the DRC, DR Congo, um, Central African Republic, and Mali, because you have peacekeeping missions in those uh, countries for an extended period of time. You also have sanctions in place since quite a long time. Um, so there are different established reporting lines you can look at. Um, and at the same time, these are cases where debates on illicit economy and violent conflict have also been quite prominent. Um, but the illicit economies we're talking about are different ones, uh, very different ones. In Mali, a lot of the, you can also see it in the reporting, is about um, drug trafficking and migrant smuggling and human trafficking, but now also gold mining uh, more recently. Um, and then, of course, also um, smuggling or trafficking. Uh, while on the DRC and Central African Republic, a lot of it is really about national resource extraction and, and trafficking or smuggling um, of those abroad. Mostly diamonds and gold are very um, prominent ones in those cases. Um, there's also other illicit economies that are like, uh, you know, the cattle trade in Central African Republic and others that are actually coming up a lot in those reports. Um, but, um, you know, there's, it's, a, it's really a substantial part in those reports, um, those kind of activities. Um, and when you look at them, I think there are three aspects that are interesting. They may not be surprising for people who have been looking into this for a long time, but I think when we talk about the policy interventions, it's very important to make these points clear because they, you know, may um, raise serious questions about how to approach the illicit economies. And the first one, I think, is that they defy the illicit economies as simple conflict logic. It means they're usually not tied to one specific group or actor. It's not that Group A is strongly involved in drug trafficking in Mali, and therefore, because other actors are not really relevant, it's a really direct entry point to get to this group, for example. It's a lot more complex, of course. Um, the other point is that very often what you see is that the violence also coming from those illicit economies, but also when it's not violent, violence or cooperation is, um, you know, spread across conflict lines and on sites of, you know, in the among the different parties to the conflict. So you may have in Mali, for example, um, groups that are officially on the same side, <laughs> you know, signatories of the agreement from 2015, being under the same umbrella organization, fighting each other over drug routes, for example. You may also have cooperation across uh, seemingly strong lines uh, in conflict. And that has actually already occurred in the Western Balkans and has been reported at the time as well, and in many other conflict areas. So, you know, certain groups uh, locally or even beyond may cooperate in illicit economies, even though they are officially on different sides of the conflict. Um, and the third point really here is, Labeling or categorization in, in those contexts is really very difficult. Um, we do know that since a long time, but it's really very, very noticeable in those reports. And you have to keep in mind, those are rather formal reports. They are not research, you know, that is, uh, you know, academic research, but they time and again bring up the point that non-state and state actors are not, that's really a blurred line. Um, you do have examples in the DRC, for example, you know, a uh, head of a militia uh, is integrated with his um, group or men into the national army, you know, but keep, keeps going, engaging in illicit business he's been doing before, getting retired, still poses as an army official, continuing his, um, uh, continuing his uh, economic activities. 
in other cases, it has been similar in Mali, where you've been seeing people kind of shifting labels officially, but continuing very similar activities uh, in those positions. Um, and it may also be that a so it may be that a person uh, is officially uh, an, uh, a general in the army, but has also other roles. I mean, that's a natural part of life, of course. That's the same. We are all not having one role, um, but sometimes outside actors treat these contexts in the way that they, you know, there is the police, and you know, with this label comes certain expectations what you do or don't do. Uh, but those reports really show. Um, that that's very misleading if you take that as a starting point. My second general point from the paper is that non-state governance really revolves around illegal taxation. What does that mean? So when you look at those reports, you clearly see that in the majority of cases, um, armed groups uh, in those violent conflicts um, mostly profit from illicit economies by illegal taxation, by skimming off revenues in that way. They do engage in the actual activities, sometimes in illicit mining um, or in other activities, but most of the time what comes up in the reports is this indirect connection. Um, and that's something that has been said time and again in other cases. So again, maybe not so surprising, but it's very, very clear uh, across these cases. And another point um, is that, and there we have to be careful because of the nature of the reports, but um, they don't say, of course, anything about how legitimate that type of governance is at all. Like That can't be read, or read out of the reports. But what is interesting, I think, is that the way they are described, these taxation systems, sometimes they really are systems, and sometimes they are parallel structures set up um, to state structures to tax um, activities or persons or areas. Um, these systems... Um, sometimes seem to kind of imply that some kind of state building project is taking place, but most of the time, actually, they seem to be really predatory. So um, what we can maybe conclude from that, at least it's something to look into, that political and criminal agendas are really blurred as well. Um, over the time, once conflicts have, you know, been going on for a long time, this has been a common assumption that um, some groups may have a clear political agenda in the start, and they still have it, but, you know, their kind of the economic interests become, you know, like uh, an end in itself almost, um, or a way of, um, of uh, yeah, economic gain that also attracts new people into groups sometimes maybe, but also changes kind of the motivation over time. That can't be read out of those reports directly, but you can see that um, uh, that the rather predatory way um, these, these taxation systems seem to work is at least an indication um, that um, the social capital they are building seems to be rather rather low, but it might not be true actually if we would have surveys on the ground. It's not a prime focus of those um, of those reports, but there seems to be also another um, something else that that should be looked into. And then finally, the wider transnational, um, link of the illicit economies. That's something really important, of course, because what comes up in the reports very often is relatively far away places, let's say Dubai in the gold smuggling out of DRC, that um, are really relevant as trade hubs for illicit economies. So again, not so surprising that this is the case, but um, sometimes you have illicit economies in conflict areas that are rather um, regional or linked to neighbor countries primarily. And there are examples for that in the report as well, in the reports as well. Um, but you do also have those that reach quite far, uh, especially on natural resources. And obviously this could be entry points for, for um, action. Um, and it has actually led to some action by those expert groups in some cases on cigarette smuggling and gold smuggling, for example. Um, but of course, that is these are very um selective, this is very selective action, mostly awareness raising, naming and shaming, putting pressure by reporting on some countries or actors, but it's not um, very sophisticated, let's say, or systematic. And the final point is you can also see that legal businesses are obviously involved in those activities as well. Um, uh, you know, there might be front companies or there might be actual companies engaging in the gold trade, for example, but they do other things on the side. So they also become part of these um, illicit structures. And there are some um, 
further points you can take on sanctions, for example, from, from those three points I just made, but I first give you the opportunity to ask questions, or maybe there are points of interest you want to raise that we should tackle more in detail. Um, so feel free. There's also a microphone here if you would like to raise anything. Yes, thank you so much uh, for the very interesting input. Um, and please, I can, can they not, yeah, okay. Um, and please feel free to raise your hand and then we'll come by with the microphone. <laughs> Let's start with Susanna and please introduce yourself briefly. And again, this is just for the online audience, but everybody knows this by now, so. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks very much, Susanna Bakritsa Stel from the Center for Conflict Studies. Um, great to have you with us, and thanks very much for um, talking about a topic on which we don't work at all. So um, it's actually um, important in, in the course of this lecture series, uh, but also for all our daily work um, to uh to learn more about you um and in a sense um you know when you started your presentation with referring to the grieving grievance debate and the old and new wars um, i realized how peace and conflict that is also goes through waves and kind of um and that's certainly a, a, a time when i start um, <clears throat> kind of discourses i engage with but at the moment they kind of disappeared but um picking up from that um i wonder um, if we believe that there are different forms of um, violence and insecurity in the context of violent conflict, are there particular forms of violence that lend themselves to particular um, forms of illicit economy trading? So civil wars as opposed to terrorism, uh, maybe it was a duration of conflict. Um, can we can we imagine a typology of different forms of violent conflict and how they are um, kind of uh, spaces for particular forms of violence? And then um, that's the first question. The second question for people who are not so much familiar with the debate, it would be helpful to just have some more uh, examples on what forms of illicit um, economies there are and maybe what the strongest are um kind of the most prevalent forms because they seem to vary in terms of extracting resources to taxing and all of that like that thanks should we um gather a few questions and then you answer them? okay yeah thank you very much uh for the talk really interesting um i have been uh thinking whether whether this is actually a topic that we don't work on or whether, whether it's just a different headline for a, a similar topic, actually. And I keep reflecting on this illicit of the of the economic networks and the violence. Um, I'm wondering what is gained and what is lost uh, if we start from, you know, focusing on the illicit aspect um, of, of the economics and, and the violence attached to it. Um, I mean... Statistically speaking, if we look into this room, about 40% of us are um, part of an Ill illicit economy buying weed from some dealer in the street. Um, and if the, statistically speaking, um, and but if the government gets its act together, then poof, um, this is not illicit anymore. Um, or if you look at um, transnational um, supply chains, and I think, as you said yourself, there is a very gray zone between illicit and legal economies and the violence attached to them, I don't think changes that strongly. So I'm wondering um, if you, just as a, as a thought experiment, if you deleted the Ill illicit and started from um, violent eco economies, what would you gain, what you, would you lose? Like, what what is this? Yeah, what does it change to, to focus on the illicit networks? Thank you. Are there any more questions for now? Otherwise, I think it's already a lot. To yeah, it is. Yeah, thanks very much. These are all really good questions. The typology of violence and violent conflict and, and how they are linked to illicit economies or not. Um, that's actually something I've been thinking about recently as well, but I don't think systematically uh, that is it's possible to answer that. Um, 
mostly, you know, this uh, debate works on case studies and it would be also maybe my criticism, but also a criticism by others that there's probably not enough focus on um, any, on, you know, violence that's below the level of, let's say, armed conflict. Um, if you look at armed conflict databases, um, but to look at uh, other forms of organized violence, um, I'm not aware that that's really systematically done. Um, there's a lot of focus on areas in Central America, for example, where um, there's high rates of, for example, homicide rates uh, or strong gang violence uh, in specific areas or countries um, due to the impact it has. And there's often the talk that this is in some countries more violent than it used to be during civil war times. So there is about the level of violence, but then and the types of eco illicit economies that matter, for example, drug trafficking as a transit zones for drugs to the US, especially um, that's prominent in the debate. But when you look at the systematic links, especially to the gang violence, um, even there, it becomes quite quickly, it becomes not so clear. I mean, it has to do with the data problem I mentioned in the beginning. So you can look at illicit economies in areas of violent conflict and um, at the ones you can identify and the patterns in them. But to actually quantify them is really a challenge. And this has been done by some, for example, there's the Organized Crime Index by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. That's global, basically. It's all the UN member countries. Um, they also kind of quantify it in the sense that they look at the scope and reach of, well, illicit economies or organized crime as part of the criminality uh, rate they, they put out. But when you look at um, that data and it's not really a strong criticism because they just try what's possible and they say it, they say what the limitations are, but obviously it's just some specific types of illicit economies. And that relates to your other part of the question. Um, what they look at is basically migrant smuggling, human trafficking, arms trafficking, drug trafficking, and well, natural resource and um, well, what some would say environmental crime, but mostly related to um, um, to, uh, you know, um, what we call uh, wildlife trafficking or, you know, the trafficking in, in rare animals and species and their parts and so on. Um, so those are the main ones. I hope I didn't forget anything. But for example, financial and economic crime, much less there. Illicit, illicit financial flows are not part of that assessment. Um, cyber crime is not part of it. And I think what we end up with is a picture that's um, actually focusing more on areas under conflict um, because others, um, those least affected by criminality are, for example, Luxembourg and Liechtenstein. And you may wonder if there would have been a different focus in terms of the type of crime or illicit economies, they would have been much more, much higher on the criminality score. Um, that's an example of, you know, how it matters um, a lot of the countries that score very low also on criminality are countries like Tuvalu or Nauru, like small Pacific island states, for example. And that's very logical because it speaks to the fact that they are probably not very prominent hubs in, in the world trade or in the global economy. Uh, not so strongly linked probably in terms of uh, trade routes, etc. So that's probably one reason. Um, uh, and that speaks to how illicit and illicit are obviously uh, connected, also by trade routes. Uh, you know, for example, containerized cargo being used for drug smuggling, etc. I mean, it's an indirect way, but it can be more direct as well. Um, your second question was, oh, the examples. What is it concretely? Yeah, so the ones I named. Um, and... I mean, in terms of taxation, it's very true when we talk about that, and you mentioned it as well, legal and illegal uh, for those groups often doesn't really matter in the sense that they tax whatever they can get hold of, uh, passage of people, of cattle, um, all kinds of um, also um, economic activity by businesses that have been there before and now have to pay taxes in order to protect themselves or sometimes also you know, for other reasons. Um, but 
So this is like the very indirect link that you have. And it's true that it's important to keep in mind that that's not just bound to illicit economies or that there's uh, also other um, uh, other links to that still legal or informal activities in the areas. That's by the taxation. Now, when we look at um, uh, the illicit economies in terms of commodity trading, um, uh, I said that most of the time the armed groups usually engage in taxation, but they are also the, I would call them now commodity traders. Um, and they have to make up their mind with whom of the actors uh, relevant on the ground do I link up? Uh, because usually they have to do this in one way or another. And there again, this can be non-state and state actors, uh, depending on um, the structures of authorities that really matter, I would say. In some cases, it's also there's also seem to be other considerations for Mali. The panel report I mentioned has been claiming that apparently a lot of the major drug traffickers have chosen to align with those groups that are officially part of the peace process under the 2015 agreement rather than those categorized as terrorists because you're more exposed if you link to them. That's the speculation, I would say, behind it. But uh, the assumption behind it, but um, that could be, you know, an important factor. Um, and on your question, I think, um, uh, I think yes. What the the point is that one reason why illicit economies have become so prominent, I think there are many, but is that indeed the most important ones, human trafficking, moved just moved apparently to kind of the first place uh, globally, but. This really depends on how you count the different categories, what you count in and not in terms of drugs, for example. But drug and human trafficking are still very significant sources, for example, globally uh, of income. And there are very high um, revenues connected to them. So that is something that has been pointed out as being very significant in comparison to some legal activities, because it makes them very attractive as a source of income. And there might uh, actually, for that reason, um, also uh, be a source of more violence. Uh, in some cases, we do see that as in Mali, where you know fighting over drug convoys is a significant factor, but it might not always be the case. That's true. But in, in general, the profits are sometimes a lot higher. Um, but you're right, and that's the interesting part as well. Um, that's one aspect or one approach I didn't mention before. I cut because of time, but legalization, <laughs> making something a regulated market that's legal, of course, is another possibility. Um, and it actually happens. And there's a lot of debates on all kinds of legalization beyond drug economies. Um, and what we see in the Central African Republic and DRC, for example, is the attempt also supported by international actors to bring back sectors in this case, natural resource extraction of gold or diamonds back into the light zone by finding a way to make them more transparent and have some more effective governance systems in place or monitoring systems as well. Obviously, this is not so easy in the context we talk about. Uh, and that's, I would say, the major point about um, having a regulated market uh, as a solution. You kind of need governance around that <laughs> to secure um, you know, that the practices of extraction, but also where the profits go, et cetera, that this is not just regulated on paper, but it actually um, is handled in a different way. Um, so in this sense, when you say, you know, you may have the same activities illicitly or illicitly in the same context, and they probably in the beginning just became illicit because an armed group took control of that area and that mine. Um, but then the question arises, how do you bring them back into the light if you want? That's a little bit of a simplifying term. But um, and that is already a strong, you know, that's an approach that's frequent, but it doesn't, of course, work for everything. Uh, in And in terms of when we talk about human trafficking, um, the obvious difference, of course, is that it involves the trade in people that cannot really be legalized these days. Uh, most countries at least have regulations in place that you know, clearly say this is uh, prohibited and it can't be, there can't be a legal market. And uh, hopefully that's something most people can agree to. Um, so there's not this option, I would say. And for drugs, of course, it's 
a long debate that we could have on that. But um, and what I said is because it's a prohibited good, then it becomes profitable. And um, but again, when we talk about drug cultivation, whether it's in Colombia or in Afghanistan, um, you can of course see that yes, the livelihood issue is a very strong part of it. And uh, for the people who may engage in these activities, they may not, of course, see them as illicit or illegal. Um, because for them, it's just the normal way of life. And in some cases, people are may really not be aware even that it's an illegal good. In most cases, I guess they are. But um, that, you know, is uh, a very, for them, it really doesn't matter. So there you're right. It's, um, it's not, there's no real difference in that. But there are, let's say, business interests that are attracted by conflict uh, or violent conflict. And I mean, arms trade is, arms trafficking is one example, but there are others. Um, for some other actors, it may not be um, uh, attractive. Uh, it's been shown that in Northern Mozambique, uh, now that since a while, the, situ uh, the security situation there has really eroded in the nor most Northern province of Mozambique. Um, for example, the heroin trafficking through that area has actually shifted to areas that are more stable and easy to pass. So conflict is not always attractive for illicit business. If it's a transit zone, it may actually just shift, but there are also other reasons why it can be attractive. Uh yes, thank you very much for uh coming and uh taking your time to share with us. Um, um please forgive me for um asking about something very specific, but I've been thinking about the point you raised about um the sort of do no crime policy and the role of international actors. Um, it's it seems to me that that do not do no crime maybe doesn't go far enough because imagine let's imagine a case where international actors come in and uh, both sort of civilian and maybe military ones and they make a point to do their procurement locally legally and so they sort of at least on a local scale, create a certain demand that is external and maybe to prices that don't reflect the local prices, right? And that is sort of inflates the demand of these um, local goods that they buy. And then inevitably they leave. And sort of recently, historically, we've seen that that happens often quite abruptly um, and without a very uh, planned out exit exit strategy and doesn't that then sort of leave a hole in the local market that makes space for more illicit um, transactional activity because people can't sell the goods anymore in that legal way that was sort of external to the local market or is that empirically irrelevant i'm sure it's not irrelevant but i don't have an empirical overview of that either um I mean, yeah, the exit management of, for example, large missions is uh, is a case in point that has been discussed um, not so much with regard to what they do with illicit economies, but of course, um, you know, uh, this kind of transition period, uh, this phasing out, which, as you said, in cases like Afghanistan, it has been going a completely different way. But obviously, that wasn't a peacekeeping mission. But um, uh, so um, uh, the. I would say it's an interesting thought uh, that when there is a more planned phasing out of missions, that this is also something to think about. Um, I wouldn't really be able to say whether it's a systematic um, criterion <laughs> in the debate within missions, for example. Uh, surely the point of we are leaving and people losing jobs and money, I mean, in that simple sense, yes. But um, with regard to what does it do with illicit economies, also, they are not a prime focus while they are there. <laughs> they are, uh, you know, a way of looking at how can we fulfill our mandate and how can we be better in doing this and do less harm. Um, but once you leave, uh, of course, the do no harm, do no crime approach then doesn't apply anymore in a direct way. Um, but what it really leaves in terms of illicit economies that become more or less relevant, um, uh, I haven't seen a really strong debate of that. Whether there's a thinking, a lot of thinking about it within missions, I can't tell really, I have to say. Um, 
but I think it's an interesting aspect. And obviously you can see if there's a very abrupt end of international engagement, like in Afghanistan, there has also been a very, very abrupt effect, for example, in the opiate uh, trafficking uh, business, like market prices, uh, et cetera. And um, there has been a, a ban basically on those activities by the Taliban after they took over power. Um, and market prices have been well, skyrocketing, but really rising after that. But what really will be happening medium to long term with this economy, illicit economy, we don't know yet. Um, most sources are before the fall of uh, Kabul. But uh, so this clearly there is an effect if this happens that abrupt. abrupt uh, um, but uh, in how far the exit management really pays attention, if it's more less abrupt and more planned, I can't really tell. It's a good question. Um, yeah, Hi, um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I have one and a half questions that might also speak to me not fully grasping at what point something becomes an illicit economy, because I'm wondering how to deal with actors whose legality isn't questioned equally in the countries. So, for example, um, like file sharing used to generate and generate, I don't know, profit for a lot of people also was associated with like um, threatening other people's lives or hiring hitmen and such. So definitely with violence and also with profit. And also in a lot of countries was prohibited to different extents, but then in Sweden, for example, uh, it was protected as well under religious freedom rules uh, because file sharing could be part of religious practice, while whereas in say Germany it would be hit with a fine if you practiced it. Or in Germany, uh, the, a few years ago, there were all these ads um, for gambling that was legal in Schleswig-Holstein in particular, but there were one everywhere in the country, and I'm pretty sure I could have gambled online everywhere in the country in ways that probably wouldn't have been like documented and then kind of taxed accordingly or adequately or transparently. Or then the Islamic State, we would probably, I'm very sure, would think of as uh, engaging in an illicit economy but then they themselves, um, when they still existed as a state, also asserted their statehood by repressing um, economic activity that outside of the Islamic State would be considered legal, like selling certain types of cell phone services or alcohol or movies, where this probably, like, who the IS as an actor was. Um, in itself, like an illicit economy, in an illicit economy that outside of it would not be considered illicit, I think, by what you said. So I'm wondering how these definitions usually are used and how to deal with conflicts when we define actors or economic segments different. We have one last question and then maybe something like that, and then we can uh -huh. final. Sure, so, of course. Okay. Um, I was wondering whether there's a um, decolonial debate about organized crime because um, I'm first and foremost thinking about uh, like when thinking about rise of organized crime, I'm first and foremost thinking about um, the British Empire, the monopoly of opium, and then kind of by banning it because it led to a lot of deaths in Great Britain, um, this gave really the rise to organized crime. Um, yes, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I start with the last one, maybe. Um, there clearly is, um, I would say, probably mostly this kind of, let's say, more historical view is uh, in certain cases, yes, there is um, work done on this. And uh, yes, a debate. Um, I wouldn't say it's an overarching or cross-cutting debate that's very strong. But for example, when you look at uh, human trafficking from uh, southern Nigeria to European countries, I've been looking into that recently for an edited volume, for example, there clearly it's very interesting to look at this um, historical pathway um, that's very much connected to uh, the history of slavery um, and then how that has been banned and how then uh, the practices have changed. Um, and then the business model that we, if I may say so, uh, that we see today um, uh, linking, uh, you know, particularly some part of the south of Nigeria with different European locations um, has actually already evolved. The, well, there's at least 1930s there are indications that this business model had already developed. So there's like 
you know, there often is a history to this. Some people often bring up um, the point that roots have, are very old and established, but I think there is a lot more to this in terms of um, how a market, let's say, has, um, you know, evolved or different practices in it. Um, and that is probably under-researched, I would say, still, um, if only because also it's quite difficult to go back very far in time if you're looking at something that's potentially also quite hidden. And then again, and that's your point, linked to norms, of course, and uh, what type of state or statehood we're talking about and how accepted it is. And I would always say organized crime, if we take that concept, is um, the other side of the coin of the state. I mean, the state decides what is what the law is, what is criminalized or not. Um, the question obviously is, um, is the IAS as a state, has this been uh, a legal entity or not? That's, uh, you know, you, you can, um, um, that's that then your assessment depends on, on the answer of that question, of course, to some extent as well. So it's not just the practice, but of course also the actors involved that may, you know, um, uh, frame whether or may decide whether you talk about something as illicit or not. But I agree, uh, and as I said earlier, Talking about illicit economies doesn't wholly solve the problem of the blurred lines, of course. Um, and you can, when I talked about commodities or transactions that are officially banned, I mean, there usually is an order in place, as you said, you know, where things are prohibited or not. Um, but indeed, this is really an issue when we talk about illicit economies in um, all areas, actually, of the world that A, this framework is changing, B, it may not be um, everywhere socially accepted, um, but also that, you know, you may enter a neighbor country and it's a different regime or system or um, only legal basis. Um, and that also uh, is one aspect that leads to this kind of blurred line of illegal or legal, and you can't fully solve that by, um, you know, choosing illicit economy as a focus. The other aspect is, even if you take like really strict measures for organized crime, for example, like what counts as serious in organized crime, you can find definitions on that that are quite precise. Um, but then you may encounter areas or countries where there's no law really in place to cover this practice that all of us though would probably agree this should be organized crime. Um, so those are really issues. I don't think we can solve them. Um, the reason I think why it still is useful to talk about illicit economies is that the kind of clandestine character at some point that this term also refers to does something often to the economy. So um, especially if the market actors are aware that this is not technically legal, um, they may not believe in that legal system or they may not really accept it in a way, but usually they know it is not uh, legal and that leads to different practices. I'd say I think the illegal market literature is quite interesting in that regard. When you see how one colleague has worked on diamond, uh, the diamond trade in Sierra Leone and out of Sierra Leone, it's interesting how market actors adapt to this. Like, um, and they maybe set up their own rules and structures of control, but they do relate to the state framework. Uh, this is also another point we haven't really tackled, but. The idea that also comes with the crime terror de nexus debate that we have ungoverned spaces, et cetera, um, uh, or remote areas out of the reach of the state. Um, superficially, that might be true, but I've come across a lot of areas you would categorize in that way. But the state is usually present in some way. It might not be very strong. It might be outpowered by other actors, um, but it somehow becomes also part of the setting. It's not always... Uh, as I said, it's not always an opposing um, uh, relationship. It can also be kind of more embedded or, as we said, symbiotic. Uh, so this is, of course, something to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, I mean, what you raised, the point is, I think, really important that cannot be fully solved. But I think for pragmatic reasons, I have to say, uh, I think it still makes sense to look at what is officially banned or listed or is listed in, in a specific area as a starting point. But yes, labels should be questioned. And they're often questioned by the actors as well, of course. <laughs>
Thank you so much again um, for this very interesting for this very interesting insight and talk um, to me as well. <laughs> invite everybody to the next session um yes so thank you again for coming um and thanks for the great questions and discussion um this was the last session for this year um but we're happy to invite you back here on the 10th of january um and we'll hear from wendy harcourt and she will talk about feminist responses to the violence of climate change um and we'll have four more lectures next year in the series. So have a good break and a good start into the next year and see you in January. Thanks. Thank you.